Uh, well, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. David Bogod, uh, calling to you from uh, sunny Nottingham in England. Uh, and I've been asked to talk a little bit about uh, medical legal aspects of communication failure in the theatre team. I am a consultant anaesthetist, recently retired, and I have a very active uh, medical legal practice. So I'm just going to share my screen and hopefully this will all work out for you. So here's what we're going to talk about. Um, I've been doing medico legal work for a long time now. Um, and uh, when I analyze uh, 21 years of medico legal uh, data, these are patients who are suing their doctors, I have found that communication problems account for around 48% uh, of all of my cases, such that if the communication issues had not occurred, uh, the patient would not be claiming against the anesthetist. That's a pretty substantial uh, proportion of patients. Um, and sure enough, if I look at my obstetric workload, which is by far the largest part of the workload, I find that communication problems between anaesthetist and patient are responsible for the continuing problems I have facing with uh, patients who feel pain during caesarean section under regional anaesthesia. And similarly, communication problems amongst professionals are the key factor when it comes to the increasing uh, medical legal burden upon the anaesthetist of uh, claims relating to neonatal brain damage. And the communication problems here are about anaesthetists, obstetricians and midwives not communicating effectively during crisis situations. If you're going to break the sort of barriers down that occur uh, when professional communication is an issue, these are the sort of things that I've been encountering regularly in my medical legal practice. Problems with crowding and noise, and many of you will be aware just how difficult it's been during the pandemic to keep communicating with people through uh, PPE equipment. Uh, general equipment issues, confusions about identity, not knowing who the person you're talking to is, not knowing how senior they are, not knowing what position they hold, assumptions about common ground when you're talking to someone you may be using a term they're not familiar with. But the three big ones I think of as task, task fixation, fixating more and more upon a task at hand, often to the exclusion of everything around you, a so-called silo mentality, confirmation bias, where you continually uh, have, you know, have a, made a wrong assumption and you stick to that wrong assumption and look for evidence that that assumption is correct to the exclusion of all else. And hierarchical rigidity, when we fail to, uh, to uh, 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 promote, to, to, to warn those above us that they may be going wrong for fear of being put down. But I'm gonna to go to a specific case that is not obstetric, which has been causing me considerable concern and upset over the last few months. It's not my case, but it's a case I've been involved in. And it relates to the death of a patient in the United Kingdom last year, uh, a middle-aged woman presenting for an emergency uh, laparoscopic appendicectomy, who is anaesthetized in a uh, major uh, British hospital in an anaesthetic room, fully equipped with, with uh, uh, monitoring, including entitled carbon dioxide. And you can see here a very short rundown of what happened. Esophageal intubation by consultant uh, at uh, T plus naught. Two registrars arriving in the anaesthetic room three minutes later. Cardiac arrest two minutes after that. The entry at nine minutes of an associate specialist into the anaesthetic room, that's a senior non-training grade below a consultant. A second consultant entering at 12 minutes and at 16 minutes that second consultant diagnosing the problem and re-intubating, sadly too late for the patient. During this time, five anaesthetists were in this anaesthetic room at different times with a CO2 monitor, with a tube down the esophagus, and yet it took them 16 minutes to reach a conclusion that the tube was in the wrong place. How on earth can this occur? And the answer is, of course, as you would expect, communication issues. So here's the consultant who was looking after the patient. He's actually a locum consultant, so he's not on the specialist register of the General Medical Council. And the waters were muddied by the fact that he gave his assistant, the operating de department practitioner, an opportunity to try intubating the patient after inducing. Uh, she took over and uh, she failed to uh, pass the tube. And so he took over, achieving what he describes as a grade one intubation with direct laryngoscopy. And by his own admission, he became increasingly fixated on a diagnosis of anaphylaxis when the patient started to deteriorate. 
And of course, those are his problems. That is classic confirmation bias. He came to his conclusion and he stuck by it, as you will see rigidly throughout. But this should not have caused patient harm with everybody else coming into the room. So what happened? Registrar 1 tells us that she entered the room because something was wrong and the saturations were low. She took over the bag, but passed it back to the consultant and then concentrated at his request on achieving a better venous cannulation. She asked what the working diagnosis was and was told it was anaphylaxis. She then concentrated on managing the subsequent cardiac arrest. When consultant two arrived, she passed the anaphylaxis message on to consultant two. And at times she mistook the vent ventilator pressure trace for the absent end tidal carbon dioxide trace. And here we see some problems, don't we? Propagation of the error originally made by consultant number one. Task fixation on cannulation and managing arrests, things she can do very well rather than challenging the, consul the consultant at the top of the table. And some equipment issues because the monitors in this particular hospital did not default to an end tidal carbon dioxide trace. And although one was on display here, she assumed it hadn't defaulted to it and it was a ventilator and it was the, actually the ventilator pressure trace was the end tidal carbon dioxide trace, if that makes any sense. Registrar number two, arrived the same time as registrar number one. Again, saturation was 85% and she said there was no Kapnograph trace. She was specifically asked, is the tube in the right place? And she was specifically told by the consultant, yes, it was a grade one view. That was the phrase that the consultant used. She was then reassured by her colleague listening to the chest at the request of the consultant, reporting breath sounds and so did not re-challenge. She then concentrated on assisting with the management of the arrest. And she says that she continued to suspect that the tube was misplaced, but says that the consultant was senior, considerably more experienced, and was very confident that it was not misplaced. And as a result of that, she felt that asking him again would not have changed his views. She said, I felt inhibited from raising my concerns about the positioning of the tube after my initial question. So what's happened to Registrar 2 here? Well, clearly, she's been trapped into the confirmation bias cycle going on here. Uh, and indeed, so has Registrar 1, who, having been given a stethoscope, listened to the chest. Because the consultant had told Registrar 1 that the tube was in the right place, she expected to hear breath sounds and so reported that she did hear them, even though, as we'll see, there were none present. She also became task fixated, assisting with the management of the cardiac arrest rather than considering the airway in more detail. And of course, there's a massive problem here with hierarchical rigidity. Here is a relatively junior member of staff seeing a relatively senior member of staff who was a shorter in no uncertain terms that the tube is in the right place and is, is, is inhibited from raising the concerns again because she is raising the concerns up the hierarchical line. So what about the associate specialist? An associate specialist is a grade below that of consultant, but it's a non-training grade. And many of these doctors are very experienced indeed, as was this one. And she actually was on the specialist register, even though the local consultant wasn't. She confirmed she found the patient cyanosed when she came into the room and thought that she must have been hypoxic for a while, was the phrase that she used. She reported spontaneously that the room was very noisy. And there were lots of people gathered in a small space. Um, she says she asked if the tube was in the right place, but she received no response to that. And she felt inhibited to ask again by her respect for a colleague and their relative seniority, even though actually in experience, she was probably the more senior. So here again, hierarchical rigidity has played a key role. And of course, she has been further inhibited and prevented from communicating with her colleagues by the physical uh, attributes of the space around her. So much so that it's entirely possible that the consultant never heard her ask if the tube was in the right place. Perhaps if he'd heard at least two people ask that, he might have done something different. And finally, we have consultant number two. Consultant number two comes in, sadly, too late. Um, and as she comes through the door, consultant one at the head of the table asks her to contact the duty consultant on call for the intensive care unit. 
and she has some difficulty doing this. She has to borrow a phone from one of the registrars and go through, find the rotor, find the phone number and call in. And some minutes are taken up by this, such as it's four minutes between her arrival and her eventual actions. She asked consultant one about the cause of the arrest and she was told it was anaphylaxis again. She asked about whether the intubation had been straightforward and was told it was grade one. Nonetheless, she noticed the absent capnography trace. She took over the bag herself and asked the associate specialist to listen to the chest. And the associate, associate specialist said that there were no breath sounds. Subsequently, therefore, consultant who called for a laryngoscope looked down the throat and re-intubated, but sadly too late for the patient. So here's another one who has become slightly deviated by task fixation. In this case, obviously a completely inappropriate task and way down the priority list, but, but that's what she went to when she walked into the room. Again, she was uh, a victim of the propagation of the error by consultant one, who continued to tell everybody that the tube was in the right place and it was anaphylaxis. How did all this pan out at the inquest, which was held a year later and which I attended? The coroner uh, found, uh, after two days of inquiry, uh, that consultant one, who gave evidence very well, was not the sort of person who would have been dismissive or aggressive when faced with a challenge to his diagnosis. So this is not an aggressive, angry person. This is somebody who probably would have managed the situation relatively quietly. And yet he was erroneously fixated on anaphylaxis. That erroneous fixation was, in the words of the coroner, contagious. It spread to other people within the room. The coroner used the word infectious, again, spreading around the room to describe the certainty of the consultant, which inhibited other staff members from making their, uh, their concerns clear. As a consequence, he did not consider ABC. ABC was, the coroner was told about ABC, airway breathing circulation, and understandably considered it very important that an anaesthetist had not considered the airway. He therefore said that this was a gross failure on the part of consultant one to provide basic medical care to the patient. And that this gross failure had a direct causal connection to the death. And he subsequently concluded that there had been neglect on the part of consultant one and that there was chaos, the word he used during the emergency. I put it to you as an audience, that neither of those are words that you want to hear from a coroner commenting upon a patient who died uh, in your care. Um, and that really is the story. It's a terrible story. It's a story which the Royal College of Anaesthetists is now, as I give this lecture, acting on, on very uh, aggressively to deal with uh, and to try to retrain people to get the message across about capnography. But it's not just about capnography. There are lessons for communication. These are they. We do and will all make mistakes in our time, but they should not lead to patient harm if there is good communication amongst members of the team. And to get good communication, we need to guard and train against confirmation bias because it's a real issue. And we all, we all experience it. That hierarchies must be shallow and non-threatening. We need hierarchies. We need someone in charge, but we need to be able to challenge them. And we need to ensure that our juniors know that they have a duty to challenge upwards, a duty to do it. And all of this can be better by good team training. I'll leave you with these messages and thank you very much again for inviting me. Thank you.